name is Marcus Ogden. Uh, I'm originally from Washington, D.C. Uh, my story is actually kind of one that's very different. Uh, I grew up in a two-parent household uh, from birth. My mother and father were married for 18 years. Uh, and then when I was, it's kind of like you know, his story, when my parents were eight, I was a little bit older, my parents divorced, but mine was flipped. My father actually raised two boys. Uh, I have a brother that actually is in the Hall of Fame uh, for the NFL, um, Jonathan Ogden, 12-year offensive tackle for the Baltimore Ravens, and myself, I played six years. Uh, my parents really instilled in me and my brother from an early age uh, faith, um, you, know, you know, being devout people. But I would have to actually say that my maternal grandmother was the one that really was the, um, the catalyst for, for prayer and for faith and for the Lord. She used to have a saying, uh, WWJD, um, what would Jesus do? And she would always tell me, Marcus, you know, or MSO, whenever you got into a situation, just always think, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Just, you know, try to live that life. So uh, I went to high school, played football um, at St. John's. I was very fortunate. I got a full scholarship to Howard University in Washington, D.C. Uh, to play sports, um, football. I remember my first semester at Howard, I got introduced to alcohol. Uh, on a very small level, uh, it was actually kind of a prank where the veterans, because um, as you go up in football, you always have the vets pick on the rookies. It's just, you know, it's just like from middle school to high school to NFL to college, it's all the same. So someone told me, Marcus, you can mix light and dark alcohol. I was like, really? Okay, so that sounds great. So I did, and I got really, really sick, um, really sick. And I remember I was just sitting in my room, and I just started saying to myself, you know, God, what is this like? Like, what is this? Like, I don't know what this feeling is. I just want to, you, know, you know, be healthy. And so after a day, of course, everything kind of went, went fine. And for the rest of that time in, uh, in college, I kind of was very faith-driven, but I was still young, so I kind of still kind of walked the line a little bit. I kind of, you know, drank some here and there. I would always pray after the whole time. I knew I would always get sick, but I was always trying to, you know, use that as an excuse that I was young. I was immature. I didn't really know what I was doing. It's okay, Marcus. You're, you're 18, you're 19, you're 20. It's okay. So um, when I went to college, I had no ambition to play professional football. None. None. I want to be a doctor, actually. Uh, my grandmother said, uh, uh, anybody here heard of Dr. Ben Carson? Uh, gifted hands. My grandmother wanted me to be Dr. Ben Carson. So I'm like, gee, that's all you want me to be is that? Appreciate it. I mean, just, why don't you just pick anybody else? Why don't you pick, you know, Dr. Charles Drew? Or why don't you pick somebody, you know, that's less, you know, tough to follow? But anyway, when I got to college, um, I found that football and biology, you know, lab didn't mix too well for me. So I ended up switching majors and I was a business major, finance. So I actually worked at Merrill Lynch in downtown DC uh, as an intern, did very well. Ended up, uh, when I was going to leave college, I had a 3.8 GPA uh, in college, in my, uh, in my core, and in my overall. So I actually had a job on Wall Street. I go to get college. I said, well, I can either go to Wall Street or I can go to the NFL. So, you know, and honestly, this is kind of where my story starts to kind of get a little bit wavy or a little bit, you know, dicey. Uh, the NFL, I was drafted to the NFL in 2003, and the NFL is phenomenal. It's the National Football League, is what you guys call it, but we, what we call it is the not for long league. <laughs> That's what we call it. Because we know that staying in the NFL is probably, unless you're like my brother, and I, I, had, I had a six year career, I was very lucky, but the average span of a football player is 1.2 years. That's what it is, because guys come in for a day, get cut. Guys come in for a week, get cut. You know, guys get injured, they get back healthy, they get on film, they get cut. That's kind of how it is. So when I was drafted, um, that's kind of when it started. I remember going out that night with some, you know, one of my brother's good teammates and friends, went out, celebrated, you know, started drinking, staying out late. And I was like, man, am I going to be able to do this lifestyle and play football? But no one really told me about it because my dad was 
at that time, we were like best friends. Like he wasn't, I mean, he was a father, don't get me wrong. But when you're 22, you're out of the house, you're making more money than your father's making, it's kind of hard for him to tell you what to do. So I ended up <clears throat> going to Jacksonville. Drafted to Jacksonville, Jaguars, uh, Del Rio, who's actually now, he's got the head coaching job with the Oakland Raiders. So um, I feel bad for him. He goes to some really bad teams, Jaguars, Oakland. <laughs> It's, he's going to have a long, long, long time. I mean, he may not win a game this year, but he's a good coach. So I, re- so I, re- so I remember in my first year getting there to Jacksonville and just being just like, it was just like the, the lights were on, like I was a deer in headlights. Everything was like so fast paced. It was absolutely insane. It was just like everything was just, you know, the vets were coming in and everybody, I was just trying to learn my way around. And I remember that uh, training camp started, and ended up, I have a, a guy named Marco Coleman. If you ever saw the movie Ace Ventura, Pet Detective, he's the guy running around the track when Jim Carrey actually jumps on his back and tries to like put chloroform on him and knock him out to check the ring and see if he was the guy that did the criminal stuff. So that's Marco Coleman. And so Marco told me, said, Marcus, if you plan to stay in this league for any length of time, if we smell fear, on you as a D lineman. If we smell fear and you're an officer lineman, you're dead meat. You're dead in the water. Never let an opponent know that you're scared. Otherwise, you will never make it. So I took that advice. Uh, we had some games and making a football team, but that was a gift and a curse. Like when I was 22 years old, my first check, well, I take it back. My first check was for like $100,000 uh, from uh, signing bonus. But then my first game check was like, 30 or 40 grand, something like that. And then after taxes, it was like 21, 22. That was in Florida, no stadium tax. I love that. So I ended up like getting thrown, excuse me, all this money at such a young age. And my faith wasn't really ready for that. Like I was into drinking, I was into gambling, I was into late nights, bad relationships. I was into just doing whatever I wanted to do, no accountability. So the NFL was a gift and a curse. I had no family to go home to, no wife, no kids, no structure. So it was kind of difficult at that time. So I remember I made this, you know, had my first year, and then I ended up getting traded to go play with my brother in Baltimore the following year, which was phenomenal. Baltimore was great, but again, bad atmosphere, the clubs, the late nights, the, you know, the relationships. There was just everything was just so Um, inconsistent. It was just so not what my grandmother had taught me to be. My grandmother had taught me to be a man of faith, a man of, you know, of, 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 of proudness, a man of integrity. And I let her down, like, kind of like you, I kind of had a double life. Like, you know, kind of like, you know, Meredith said, she had that double life. Like, I pretend to be the church going, Mom, MS say you go to church on Sunday? Uh, well, Grammy, not today. We have a game today, but I'll go after. You know, I'll go, I'll do something after. I mean, we have, we're playing the Buccaneers in like four hours, but I'll get there after, I promise. So, but in reality, I knew I wasn't going to go. I, I knew that. I mean, I was just saying what she wanted to hear. That's how I did it. I just, you know, I wanted to make her happy and not have her feel any type of way, but I knew that's what I wasn't doing. So after my you know, career kind of went there, and Baltimore was great, and I had a nice career with Baltimore, then I went going to Buffalo, which was phenomenal. Uh, but again, life was just, you know, was just a struggle. And I remember I was in Buffalo. My uncle passed away, my dad's brother. My grandfather had five boys. He had buried, at the time, two already. One was two days old, one was a year old, well, two years old. Then my uncle had died of 50 of stomach cancer. I was in Buffalo playing for the Bills. I had left to go to, to, uh, to his uh, funeral. I remember, though, looking at my father. My father was a big man, probably about 450 pounds at his largest, and he ended up having kidney failure. So he was on dialysis three times a week. So I remember seeing him at the funeral, and I'm thinking to myself, this isn't good. Like, I just had that gut feeling, this is not good. Like, my dad's not himself, you know, it's just, it's just, it just doesn't feel right. So that next off season, I ended up, you know, I was home, you know, doing whatever. My dad had a, um, had a, um, had a heart surgery, had what's called constrictive pericarditis, where the valves around your heart tighten, so you need to have heart surgery. 
And I made a decision that probably haunted me for up until about two years ago, for, for about eight, years, eight solid years. The doctor came to me and said, Mr. Ogden, your father's not strong enough to make this decision on his own. He needs to have massive heart surgery. And, you know, I was like, okay, sure, sure, we'll do that, no problem. So he did. So I, <laughs> oh boy. So I, uh, I signed off on it. Signed off on it. No problem. Well, went through the surgery. He made it. Everything was good. No problems. So after surgery, he went to ICU. Everything was good. He was recovering. I got a phone call at about maybe 2.30 in the morning from a, doc, from a hospital attendant. Marcus, you need to get to the hospital quickly. Your father's gone to cardiac arrest. I'm like, what? I'm like, what? I just left y'all like a few, like a couple of hours ago, like, you know, probably like nine o'clock that evening. What's going on? What happened? So I did, from Baltimore to DC, it's probably like an hour and a half drive. I jetted, I was up there in 50 minutes. Got there about three, I guess three, I got there at like 3.31, 3.32 in the morning. Um, he was pronounced dead at 324. So I had missed him by about seven minutes. Uh, uh, so I remember calling my brother, who literally, I've never heard a six foot nine, 370 pound monster on the football field scream like that in my life. Never. He had just left to go home to Vegas to get ready for training camp. And I'm talking about a gut-wrenching scream that I will never forget. So but what had happened was my father was left unattended in the hospital, and he drowned to death in his own vomit um, in his bed at the ICU center. So after that, I ended up... Um, I ended up burying my father, everything there. I didn't want to live for a long time. I drank, I did everything bad you could think about. Then I left the game of football. God says, time to get out of football. I tried to go back. I did, all right. I did well, then I hurt my back, and it says, time to retire. So I started a construction company. That was doing, huh, it was like I was totally new to the industry, and I ended up struggling and failing with some issues, some jobs, met a good person, met a partner, ended up revitalizing, this was 2008, revitalizing the company, ended up doing some big, good things, got a big job for about $400,000 at a college fraternity house, um, I'm sorry, it's a sorority house, excuse me, uh, big difference, sorority house um, at um, University of Maryland, and the job put us on the map. So I, within a four-year period, I took a company from $0 to about $12 million in revenue with, with the right people, all the type of stuff. So everything was feeling great, top of the world, but again, I just still wasn't living life correctly. I was caring about the cars, I was caring about you know, the parties, I was caring about the clothes, I was caring about the jewelry, the watches, you know, the stuff that doesn't mean anything, the alcohol, I mean, the stuff that doesn't mean a thing in the world, I cared about the most. So then I ended up, uh, uh, taking on a project for a company for about $4 million, big job. Like, it was, that was the job that was going to put us on the map. But again, God said, Marcus, this is not where you belong. And so, not directly, but indirectly, he had told me, by doing this process, we started a project, doing everything was phenomenal, started on the work, everything was great. Ended up where we had to, what's called dewater. Anybody here in construction? Or anybody here know anything about construction at all? We had to dewater the site. And brought in a, a contractor out of Texas to dewater the site. Basically, what you would do is to pull all the water from the ground so you can put down the foundation for the building. So we hired a company that came into the job. Long story short, the job site wouldn't dry. The job site just would not dry. And the owners and the GC said, Marcus, just take care of it. We know, let's, let's go ahead and do this. Oh, in this process, by the way, I ended up meeting my, my wife. So I met her about, probably about 
about three or four months after, I, probably about five months after I started. So, and so she came along for a really wild ride. But anyway, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, so ended up, couldn't drive a site. $1.5 million later of my own money, personal money, loans, bank loans, you name it, $1.5 million later in a 90-day period, the site dries. But here's the catch. The owners and the general contractor did not pay the change order. I was stuck with it. So this whole time, I actually met my uh, girlfriend, who was my fiance, who became my wife, met her online uh, on Match.com. Yes, Match.com. Uh, and I could be a commercial. Uh, but in reality, she met me at a time where things were starting to demise. And she met me at a time where I was probably, other than my father's death, at my absolute lowest. Because I went from money in the bank, prestigious contractor, number one minority. I was the number one minority contractor in the state of Maryland within a four-year period. But when you lose a million five in 90 days, <laughs> it's going to hurt. And it's going to hurt bad. So when I didn't get it signed off on, I looked in the bank. After my NFL career, my father's death, getting money from his house, everything that I had made, I had amassed over my career, I had less than $2,000 in my bank account. I had made millions in the pros, I had made millions as a contractor, I had made all the type of money you could think about, cars, everything, gone, gone. So I went to, uh, to someone and said, what do I do? I said, Marcus, you need to either do one of two things. One, you need to either file ba bankruptcy, or you better have the, the thickest skin in America to deal with the debt that you have amassed, which was, by the way, over $5 million of debt. I said, I can't, I can't, I can't pay that. I couldn't even afford to pay the bankruptcy off. $3,000. I couldn't pay it. I, ha I, had to put, I had to put a down payment a $400 to my bankruptcy attorney, okay? So then, this whole time I'm with my wife, my wife fiance, and so she, I'm keeping everything from her. I'm lying, I'm just, I'm just like, I'm hiding everything, I'm not telling her everything. So then she, as I guess she found a genius way, she got into my emails and she hacked in and she started seeing my stuff all on her own. I was like, what? You don't trust me? I was like, nope, I was like, okay, I don't blame you. I'm not telling you everything. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not mad at you. I'm, I'm, I'm lying to you. We don't have any money in the bank. We have nothing. So then what I did was I decided to call the NFL office. And a guy named Andre Collins, who played for the Redskins, was an all-pro linebacker, said, Marcus, we can help you. Let's help you find a job. Let's help you relocate. And let's try to get you some money through the Gene Upshaw Trust Fund. You ever, I'm sure you guys all watch NFL Sunday, right? So anytime somebody gets a fine, like a late hit or whatever, that money goes into an account where it helps retired players who have issues. So I apply for a loan. So then the, the NFL helped me find a job down at Merrill Lynch in Durham. Okay? And I thought I had found it. Nah, I still hadn't found it. Because <laughs> I had not picked up a book to study in probably 10 years, minimum. And when I was in college, I was good, but it was still a long time. So anyway, I'm going through this whole process, this whole process. And again, you know, my wife and I are kind of, you know, trying to, we're fighting all the time because, you know, it's, when you're in a financial situation where you come from having so much then to losing it, like, you know, every relationship is going to have a problem. I mean, it's, it is. If you're going to get married or have a relationship, it's going to have a problem. It's just the way it is. But ours was intensified by the fact that I was lying about my broke situation. You know, I wasn't telling her the truth. But anyway, I had just moved her from North Carolina with her, with her eight-year-old daughter to be with me in Baltimore, and when she got there within less than 30 days, I'm, I'm going broke. And she has no idea. She left her job as a teacher making money to be with me. So anyway, so we moved down here, and I'm working at Merrill Lynch. I'm like, this is not going to work. I, I can't do this. So I was driving home, and I remember I got a phone call from Bonnie, uh, and she told me, Marcus, Marcus, the NFL trust had come through. I'm like, what? So I was just laced. Basically, I was just, and oh, by the way, this time in my life, I started to live the right way. 
I started to slowly come around. You know, I was still doing some things that we shouldn't have done. I was still drinking a little too much, stuff like that. But the relationship started to kind of get better. I had quit gambling, you know, or I'd done a kind of recreational, hey, you're going to play some 25 cent poker. That's fine. Because I used to play poker for 40 hours at a time, like just sit there until I just fall asleep at the table. So I remember the NFL trust paid for four months of my rent, paid for my utilities, and it paid for my electric. So it allowed me to actually leave uh, uh, Merrill Lynch. Thank, thank you, God, because that was not going to be my job. I, just, I, love, I love sales, but not that type of sales. So anyway, I then found my calling, which was the youth. I'm very good at teaching football, but also character development. I'm good at teaching you know, life skills, you know, training. So I started my football program. And this time, life started coming around. I started kind of being more accountable in the house. I stopped, you know, arguing so much. I started, actually, I went and saw a therapist and, uh, and, and started getting my mental stuff straightened out because I have had a very bad relationship with some people in my family for a long time, long time. Very close family members I've had a very unstable relationship with. My mother and I have been on and off just because of the fact she left when I was eight. And we have never really gotten on the same page since, which has been now 25 to 27 years. So, and then losing my father and then signing off on his surgery and things of that nature, you know, living life in a, in a very unpositive, unproductive way. So now what I'm doing now is I'm actually telling my story to people that really are afraid to hear. Everyone thinks the NFL is just such a dream league. It's like, you know, it's such a cakewalk. If you talk to somebody that's actually played for any type of length of time, it's a job. It's not a glorified, you know, oh my God, you know, like someone asked me the other day, you get ready to lose this autograph? I'm like, no, that was my teammate. Like, I don't want his autograph. I don't, I don't, I don't, I, I, I'll hit the guy. I'm not going to ask for an autograph, you know? And it's just like the lifestyle that you live can be very harmful if you're not prepared for it. It can be very harmful, and it can be destructive, it can be catastrophic, and it can just cause you all kinds of problems. Again, I tried to build my life with the construction company. I just took on a big project, I took a calculated gamble, and I missed. I'm not, I'm not a bad person, you know? I didn't, I'm, not, I'm not awful. I took a calculated risk, and I missed. But what I can say is how I was living was awful. I can say that. I can say that the drinking, the nightlife, the relationships, that was awful. But now I am, I have a book coming out, Sleepless Nights, I'm an author. I have my, I'm an entrepreneur. I work with different public speaking events for Fortune 500 companies. I work for companies that, such as NetApp or the Boys and Girls Club or the Congressional Black Caucus. So I mean, I do, my story is trying to reach not just people that are just going to work at it, but athletes that want to get there. Or if you want to be a business owner, like take my story and my struggles and my mistakes and be better than me. I tell all my clients that I train, don't try to be like me, be better. I'm giving you information and knowledge when you are 14 years old that I didn't get to when I, I was 24 years old. You have a 10 year head start on me. Be better than me. Don't try to just be me. But I will leave you guys with this. My father-in-law, has a saying that God is seldom early but never late. God is seldom early but never late. When my father died, I literally, I just asked my, my wife, I said, how in the world did I stay alive? Like from the drinking and the driving when I was drunk. And I remember one time I got stopped by a police officer. I was intoxicated. He said, Marcus, I know who you are. Just do me a favor, get home safe. I'm like, okay, but that's not right. Like, I, that's not good. Like, he shouldn't have done that for me. Like, he should have, maybe if he would have stopped me then at 25, and that would have changed my life then. I don't know, but maybe I would have changed my life then. He wasn't doing me a favor. He thought he was doing me a favor. Like, I didn't want a favor. I want someone to, I was calling out for help. Like, help me. So now, my kids can come to me for help. You can, if you're 18, 19, 20, if you're, whatever age you are, I've been through it. Drinking, gambling, you know, I've been through all that. And I can tell you that if you have a problem, it can get better. Just have faith in God and try to trust his plan. So now I'm doing my calling. I love it. 
I love speaking to people, telling them my story. I love just being encouraging. Again, anyone has any questions about anything else, you know, please let me know. But I now have my life back in order, and I'm as happy as I can be. I'm glad I was able to come down and tell you guys my story. And I am glad. Thank you for having me down, Kim.